coming to the event. It's really wonderful to see so many familiar faces. And I also want to thank Book Culture. And um, I almost feel like I don't really need to introduce this book because so many of you have heard me complain about it for so long. <laughs> that, you know, you kind of know what, what it's about. And so many of you have been there for different moments of it through the thick and thin of it. So, but anyway, it's very nice that, that you're here. But for those of us that, uh, those of you in the, in the audience that uh, don't know much about the project, I can just say a few words about what the book's about. Uh, the book's essentially a, uh, a history of the origins of postmodernism in architecture, and I try to focus on one of the kind of unexamined origins of architecture, which is uh, architectural phenomenology. So the book begins with this question of why don't we know more about this thing called architectural phenomenology, which, which was so critical to the development uh, of the early stages of postmodern, postmodern thought uh, and in, uh, in architecture in particular. And I try to, first of all, to distinguish architectural phenomenology from the philosophy of, of phenomenology, because so much uh, the, the kind of knee-jerk uh, uh, approach is to think that basically architectural phenomenology is a kind of derivative of architects reading phenomenology and getting it wrong. And so I try to trace the history of, of how does this intellectual formation come to being how does architectural, uh, architectural phenomenology come into being, and to unearth the, 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 the various strands that, that uh, make it up. So uh, I look at, for example, the importance of camouflage, of photography, of graphic design, of different modes of architectural investigation, of different modes of architectural intellectuality. So part of what is at stake in the book is what is architectural intellectuality if it's not just purely language-based. Uh, and I try to look at this moment uh, beginning in the 1940s and 50s and up until the 70s, really, this is why you know, we're kind of, I'm looking at the early stages of, of postmodern thought, in which this question of, uh, in which the architectural uh, field, its intellectual dimension is, in a sense, undergoing a, a fundamental restructuring. And I look at the conditions for that restructuring. Uh, and so, uh, you know, in, in the past, this, this for me posed a historiographical problem. So, um, because so much that is discussed about architectural phenomenology is seen as context. You know, this was in the air. This was what everybody talked about. In fact, every, every uh, architectural school assigned reading from Heidegger or phenomenology of other sorts. And so how does one, um, uh, so there, the other thing that is at stake in the book is, of course, this historiographical problem of how does one deal with context? How does one try to understand what is the context of thought, what, what, shapes, what shapes the discipline? And so, um, you know, I encountered a, a problem in that uh, mostly one, the, the way that one writes architectural history is mostly monographs. One looks at people, mm -hmm. uh, architects, they have a good, you know, they're born and then they die, so then one has really good beginning and end points to, to look at architectural history. Or one looks at self-selected groups of architects, so people that form, in, you know, uh, uh, groups for whatever reason, Team 10 or, uh, or, or, or CM or Gatopak or... Uh, every country, you know, we, we, we all know the, the usual suspects. And you know, for me, the argument was that basically, you know, when we look at self-selected groups, it's essentially another form of monograph. We're, we're essentially look at, looking at people that have come together to advance a certain architectural idea or a certain project. But essentially, the, again, the context or what's in the air remains unspoken or is always pushed to the background. So how does one bring that background into the, into the foreground and, and study it? So I developed this... Um, what I call a polygraphic historiography, which is essentially a way to take into account, um, you know, both uh, various various uh, uh, strata of architectural discourse. So both uh, textual, uh, visual, but also for me, uh, critically, how to take into account people's lives. So generations for me are very important. So um, the, the idea that you, if, if it is the context, if it is what's in the air, then many people share that, that don't necessarily have anything in common with one another. That might not like each other. So how does one put into a book uh, 
two people and tie them together that don't like each other, maybe never talked to one another, never, never went to a conference together, but somehow intersect within, uh, within academia, within professional circles, and so on. And so in that, I begin to develop the idea of generations uh, and, and the fact that at any particular time, there are at least three generations of people kind of struggling for dominance within a field. So there is a little bit of Foucault in, 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 the, in, you know, in the kind of discourse uh, analysis, but the attempt for me was to really understand how does one shift, how do, how does, how does the, how do paradigms shift? And so I, I felt uneasy uh, with, with Foucault in the sense that it, it, I felt like things are always depicted as if they kind of have um, their own logic and, 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 and paradigms kind of shift out of their own, uh, out of their own volition somehow. So I was trying to recuperate a sense of, 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 of agency, uh, maybe not a subject, but some, some sense of agency within that. Um, and for me, it was critical to, to really look at generations and to look at these struggles because you can have a great idea, but, you know, eventually you will die. So, you know, how does that idea, in a sense, carry on? So somebody either has to pick it up or reinvent it or so on. So, so the book is structured along, uh, along that route. I look at Jean Labatou, who is kind of a former generation, and then the generation basically born in the 30s of, uh, of um, uh, Charles Moore and Norbert Schultz and Kenneth Frampton, and of course, uh, you know these these people don't. Apart from Labatou and and uh, Charles Moore, who were professor and student of one another, the others don't have. They don't necessarily see themselves as a group. So that was the idea of a polygraphic historiography to really tease out what is uh, of common currency uh, among them. And so I look at, for example, this, this idea of experience. Why were they all interested in experience? And how did they come to that? You know, and I, of course, look at the moment in which, um, there, of course, questions of experience have a long history with architecture, going back to empathy and so on in the, in the 19th century. But the way that experience had been theorized had been, of course, uh, as, as the kind of deeper source for two very important modernist concepts form and space, which were kind of the, the overriding paradigms of modernist architecture, these kind of abstractions. How does one abstract from historical form and so on? So I look at, you know, how does that shift to not form and space, but history and theory? How, do, how does experience become the source of a, of a discussion for, for history? And that's why the book is called Architecture's Historical Turn. How, does, how do architects turn their attention to, to history? And of course, history at the time was the uh, what was the paradigm of intellectuality in, in, in architecture. When you took an, a course in architectural history, that was the most intellectual course that you could take in, in the school. Uh, and so I look at the way in which architects in their turn towards history weren't necessarily just trying to turn towards historical precedent or so on, but were trying to intellectualize the field. They were trying to think about uh, uh, what, what, what is intellectuality. And they were trying to explore that through various means, uh, which were not just written. And because they were not just written, we've had, we've had the tendency to not look at them. And so I try to bring that up and to then begin to uh, try to analyze it, to look back, look at buildings as, as intellectual positions, look at magazines as intellectual positions, uh, look at drawings as intellectual positions, and how these things um, kind of come together. And so, uh, of course, within that, um, Phenomenology plays a huge role because phenomenology is the kind of the word of reference in the post-war period to to deal with uh, with, uh, with with experience in general. Uh, and so within you know I, I look at how phenomenology, for instance, comes to be adopted within architecture, and it's not an easy story. It's not just like people turn to uh, here's a great book, phenomenology. You know, let's let's read it. I look at the difficulties of actually adopting phenomenology uh, and looking at phenomenology because, of course, during the 50s, there was the time of McCarthyism in America, and Sartre was a, a, a very much a Marxist. That was, you know, existentialism was, was certainly the paradigmatic uh, philosophical tradition for looking at experience and was coded with all sorts of uh, notions about liberate, liberation and authenticity and, and, and so on. But uh, it was essentially, uh, in America, seen as a Marxist philosophy, so it wasn't taught anywhere. So I, I look at the, 
real uh, nitty-gritty of pedagogy and who was teaching 